Today, we are joined by Dr. Wicks, who is going to teach us how to play the upcoming release Robotech Reconstruction. For those of you who enjoy anime or the coin system, you're going to want to take a look at this here today on Legendary Tactics. Yeah. All right. So let's go into it. Welcome to Robotech Reconstruction. This is, <laughs> this is yeah, this is a game. This is your pilot, that, this is your yeah. pilot speaking. Yeah, this is your pilot speaking. This is uh this is a game that that takes place during the last nine episodes of the first arc of the season of uh Rob of Robotech. So we are in a very particular time. We are two years out from the first Robotech war. Um, you know, first Robotech war, meaning that there will be more later, but that hasn't happened yet. We are currently in the far, far future of 2013. And the first Robotech war was between the humans and the aliens and Trotty. And the humans led by the Robotech Defense Force uh, defended the, I should, I should change my color. There we go. Led by me, the Robotech Defense Force, the heroes of the show. Uh, they de successfully defended Earth against the Robotech, against the aliens and Trotty. Now the aliens and Trotty wanted to, to destroy the entire planet, but because of the efforts of the Robotech Defense Force, the Zentradi were only able to destroy about 90% of it. So because we weren't completely annihilated that we consider that to be a win in our book. Um, and and the, the, the thing, impressive thing here is that not all of the Zentradi died in the war. In fact, many of them crash landed on the planet. And in the last two years, they have taken up a civilian lifestyle. But for these Zentradi who were born and bred for war, the concept of civilian life is very eh, iffy for them. And it doesn't quite jive with what they're used to. So me, the Robotech Defense Force, I win this game if I'm able to keep five or more civ Zentradi civilians content in uh, content across this board. Mm -hmm. And the, that is important because the last thing that I want is a Zentradi uprising, which brings us to our second faction, the Zentradi Rebellion. The Zentradi Rebellion is led by Commander Chiron. Commander mm -hmm. Chiron during the first Robotech war was a mid-level commander who uh, became, who now after the war is like the highest ranking military officer left in the Zentradi force. Now he's been hiding out for the last two years in the show. They show him in Antarctica. They show him in the Amazon rainforest. He's all over the place. Uh, the RDF never found out where this guy was. So he's hanging out at his hideout. And if you look on your board, you have a hideout that your troops are going to hang out at when they're not on the main board. Mm. And the thing about, Z and, and, Z and Chiron's spies have been telling him that there are, uh, dis there is dissent amongst the Zentradi civilians. So Chiron thinks that now is the right time to rise up, bring, get his forces back and finish the job that was started two years ago. So unlike the other three players at the table who have to meet their victory condition, and have, have it met at the end of the round, Chiron just needs to get 11 Zentradi civilians off the board. Once mm -hmm. he does, that is um, his, his rebellion succeeds and he is able to carry the day because once a Zentradi civilian comes off the board, there's no way of getting them back. They become part of his army. Um, so, so that is how he wins. Our next faction is the Anti-Unification League. This is a human Zentradi mixture of civilians who for the last two years have been under the yoke of the RDF military. They've been living under military rule because the RDF and their SDF-1 that crashed creating new Macross City, um, they've they they're the most technological thing that survived the war so they've been the rdf has been stabilizing the water cycle the nitrogen cycle making sure that plant life lives you know they've been doing all this stuff to make sure that people are set up and living but what it means is that for everybody else they have been underneath the rule of the rdf they've had tabs on everything and so the anti unification league has formed because things are now starting to work on their own and they're like well we don't need the rdf anymore we need we want to have independence from this military rule and so when you play as the aul your goal is to 
control at least five at least five or more cities across the board uh, in order to meet your victory condition. Because the only way for this independence movement to work is to make it is to get it everywhere, or it's just going to be put back under the boot of the RDF. The final faction that we want to talk about is the Robotech Expeditionary Force, or the REF. Now, during the first Robotech War, not all Zentradi fought against the humans. In fact, Commander Britai, who's running around, uh, who is hanging out on the REF flagship here on the board, um, he defected right but right at the right before the war started and he actually fought with the humans to fight off uh the rest of the zentradi now what britai knows is that out there in space there are other threats there's more zentradi there's these guys called the robotech masters there's threats that are coming in season three that we won't even talk about here <laughs> but he knows that the only way that that the earth can survive these threats is for the planet to stay united underneath the RDF military. So what Britai is trying to do is to ensure consolidation of, of the planet. So if they're able to control, if they're able to get under the control for the RDF, uh, seven or more territories on this board, um, that th they will win the game. Now, in this game, because we have a three player game, the REF will be played by a bot. Now, a bot still gets a couple of key things. They still get their hand of cards and the bot can still win. And the bot can, and the bot during their turn is also going to cheat a little bit. So this is not going to be, you know, this is the, the bot of the REF is not the same as if a human player was playing it, but depending on what Britai likes to, wants to do over the course of the game, and we do affectionately call this bot drunk Britai, <laughs> um, because sometimes, because sometimes he does goofy things. Sometimes he's very on point. Um, you're never quite sure with Britai, but um, but he will, you know. But it is possible for the REF to win, even though it's a bot. Yeah. Um, and that is something to, you know, it can still be a very threatening presence, and the bot still has a active role to play in the game. So let's talk about what we're looking at here on the board. At the base of this game, it is an area control game. So when you look at this board, you'll see that there are 13 spaces. We have three zones, the industrial zone, the fabrication zone, and protoculture zone. Uh, they're, they tr are treated slightly different, but that's because the key thing about them is more of this protoculture chit inside the zone more so than the zone itself. And we'll talk about that later, but just note that there, that that exists. Meanwhile, the rest of the board is divided into 10 territories. We have five land territories, the wastelands, the Northwest quadrant, the forest preserve, the Excalibur command center and the reclamation sector. And we also have five city territories, New Portland city, New Macross city, Monument city, New Detroit city and Granite city. Now cities are denoted by the fact that they have the name city in them. And because they have this curved border, whereas all the land territories are uh, straight. Each of these territory and uh, each of these territories within them also has a uh, a civilian contentment track. So if we look over here on Excalibur, you'll see that we have one civilian sitting inside of this track, and a civilian can be content, which is all the way over in the left hand side. For every Zentradi civilian on all the way over in this left hand side, is a point towards for me the RDF. But civilians can also be uh, upset, angry, and then can get so angry that if they ever get over to this Zentradi symbol on the right-hand side, they actually come off the board. And instead, they come off the board giving a point for the Zentradi rebellion and a covert soldier makes, it, makes its way into the hideout. This is the main way that the Zentradi rebellion gets their units is by pulling these civilians off and getting them into their armed forces. And like I said, once these once these civilians come off the board, they never come back. Um, you'll also notice that when we talk about these civilians, the in the land territories, there's like one apiece. In these three southern cities, we have two civilians apiece. In Monument City, there are three civilians oh, up wow. here. Okay. And over here in New Macross, we have four, nah, we have four civilians hanging okay. out here and if you see underneath we got little symbols that's just for setup to tell you where they oh, go yeah. 
Um, yeah. Um, so yeah. as part of my goal uh, as the um, our sorry, AUL, the AUL, AUL. Yep. I need to conquer all five or have control of all five cities, correct? You need to control five or more cities. Here's the thing about you as the AUL. You have the ability to build more cities as the game goes on. Oh. So even if you don't control all five, you can still alter the map by using by building out these city tokens onto the board. Okay, so that's because I was just thinking, okay, I've got to control all the cities currently on the map. <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it, it's not necessary. It, it doesn't, it, it, it's not necessarily easy, but it is, it is possible. And again, you create more pressure by putting these city, by building these cities out. Okay. Um, okay. So, like I said, the base of this game is an area control game. So, what is, how do you how do we determine uh, control of these 10 territories? Well, each territory can either be controlled by the RDF or AUL. And there's a, a control token in most of these territories showing you who currently controls what. If we look over here in New Portland City, you'll see that we have two RDF military mecha, two AUL partisans, and one Zentradi warrior. Now, the important thing to understand is that when we count for territorial control, the REF and RDF's forces combine towards the total of control, whereas the AUL and the Zentradi Rebellion, their forces also combine for, uh, for territorial control. So in New Portland City, we basically have two on three. So the control of New Portland City goes to the AUL. Meanwhile, over here in Monument City, we have two military mecha, two AUL partisans, and now it is two to two in the territory. So the territory goes uncontrolled. And as you will see on your faction boards, there's a lot of things that require control of the territory in order for it to count. So these, um, so having a territory uncontrolled, it can also be a big deal. And the thing about territorial control is that it is a step-by-step -step thing. It's very fluid. It's whatever, it, whatever the status is at this point in time is what control is, right? So yeah. right now it's Mon Monument City is, uh, is uncontrolled. But as soon as one other piece comes in for, say, the RDF, this, this territory now is now controlled by the RDF and they can do things as per having control of that city. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so control is very fluid and it does matter. Um, so then you'll also see that each faction has one hero standee. Uh, the RDF has Rick Hunter and New Macross. The REF has uh, the their flagship in the Northwest Quadrant. Minmay is hanging out down here in Granite City, and of course, Chiron is in his hideout. Each of these hero standees also count as one point towards control of a territory. So in New, this is why New Macross City is controlled by the RDF because it's effectively three to two in this territory. Yeah. Um, and that is also why the Northwest Quadrant is controlled by the RDF because the flagship counts as one point towards control. Okay, so let's talk about what you actually do on your turn because players are going to take a series of turns in this game. And um, if the base of the game is area control, the heart of the game is, these, is the event cards. We have a bunch of event cards here. And the way that it works is that um, every player is going to get four cards into their hand. Each of these cards will do different things. Uh, each of these cards have different events on them, but um, you're gonna have these cards in your hand. And when you go through your turn, cause we have a turn tracker here that keeps track of who has gone uh, already in the round. But um, when it is your turn, you're going to go and take, you're going to do four things. The first thing you're going to do is you have the option of trading a card. The second thing is you are then going to play a card underneath your faction symbol here at the turn order. Uh, then that card is going to resolve. Third thing that happens is you are going to take command, which means you're going to take one or two, act two different actions off of your faction board. And then the fourth thing you're going to do on your turn is you're going to draw another card signifying the end of your turn. 
And, um, and so the first thing is the optional card draw, card trade. When you trade, you trade for one for one with other people. We do not trade with the bot. Uh, and that encourages us, us, the human players to continue to trade with each other. Um, but it's, uh, it's a one for one card trade. This is a game that highly encourages talking, table talk, negotiations, making plans and whatnot. And there's just two rule, two main rules to it. The first one is that there's no private conversations. Everything that's said is said at the table openly to each other. So we don't want, we don't want people leaving the table for private conversations or having side chats, et cetera, et cetera. Everything needs to be at the table. And the mm -hmm. second thing is that um, any deals that are come to amongst players are, is not binding. And the reason for that is not because this is a game of backstabbery or like, Oh, I tricked you. Ha ha ha. It, it's more like, it's more because the game itself is highly tactical. So when you come to an agreement with another player, um, if you say, well, I'm going to trade a card with you now, you play this card, I'll play your card now, and then you'll play my card later. By the time we get to later, it might not make sense to play that card anymore. Mm -hmm. So um, the game doesn't punish you for trying to like enforce deals that you have made with each other. Mm -hmm. um, and so... Um, and so, so that's, so that's why that happens. And like, there's not, you know, it actually follows along with the show where you have these, the high level people are like, oh, are weirdly always talking to each other, which is something you don't get in real life where like the commander of the terrorists is like openly mocking the commander of the yeah. RDF. It's yeah. like, that doesn't usually happen, um, <laughs> to their faces, right. Overcomes. Yeah. It's very funny when it happens in the show, but you're like, mm, this wouldn't happen in reality. But we get to <laughs> imitate that here. Where we get to talk smack to each other in yeah, real nice. time, right? Yeah, um, perfect. <laughs> so, uh, so you're going to play a card. And so after the optional card trade, and the other thing about the card trade is that even when we go, so th this game plays up to four rounds. And even when you play all four rounds, there's only about 30 some cards in the game. And even when you play all four rounds, only half of the cards ever get played. So when we're talking about card trades, it's just as viable to uh, get a card into your hand to make sure it never gets played as it is to trade a card to somebody else to make sure it does get played or get a card in your hand so it happens, right? Um, it's, it's fairly easy to like stock cards away and be like, this will never see the light of day. Uh, I had one of those games where these and Trotty player looked at their hands of cards and then they took one card, they put it face down and they put it like under their sheet. Yeah. And I'm like, what are you doing there? And he goes, no one will ever know this card exists. <laughs> it, it will, it will not happen. Ever. So I'm just going to put this here. So I'm not even tempted to like trade it away. It's like, okay, that's fair. Um, it's like that's fair and of course it's a card that really helped out the rdf yeah <laughs> right it's like no no we're, we're, just, we're just that's gone yeah. for this game right um so there's that um so the second thing you're going to do is you're going to play a card so when you play a card you're going to take it and you're going to play it uh underneath your a faction symbol uh, because that this signifies that it's your turn. So you're going to play the card under your turn. Now, when we look at these cards, it has four parts to it. In the upper left-hand corner, we have the faction indicator that just tells you which faction is going to resolve the events on the card. No matter who played it, this player is going to resolve the events on the card. So like this card says, place four out of place four partisans from out of play into any one city. Well, this is great. I play the card, but the AUL still gets to decide which city that these partisans are going to be put out into, right? So okay. even if I play the card, they get to, they still get to make the choice. Um, but so that just tells you what the faction is. Uh, every faction has the same number of cards throughout the deck. Uh, so there's, there's an equal number of faction event cards for each faction in this game. And then uh, the second thing is on the right hand side, we have the uh, the reaction column. This mm -hmm. tells you who is going to go next in the round. So here, uh, this because since the RDF has already gone, 
we shift down to the second one and we say, oh, okay, well, the REF is going to go next. And we just put their token there to let them know they are going to, they are going to happen. They are going to go next. And so in this way, the player who goes first decides who goes second in a round. And the player who goes second decides who goes third and fourth. Uh, this is pretty important because obviously whoever goes last in a round has you know, it has a little bit more of an advantage. So who's going to go last becomes a big deal once we get out of, once we get out of the first round um, mm -hmm. where we don't, no one can win in the first round. Um, so when that happens, so after we see who goes next, we then have uh, the black box action. We have a white box action and a black box action. The white box action is the event on the, of the card and must be carried out by that faction holder to the best of their ability. Um, even if you don't want to, you need to do carry out the event on the card. Sometimes you'll see an event and you're like, oh, I have to do what now? Uh, okay. <laughs> oh, and now, and now you, gotta, you gotta go through with it, right? You gotta mm -hmm. do it. Um, so there's that. And then on the bottom of the card, there's a black box action. This black box action is an optional action for that faction, for the faction. So if the RDF here played the AUL card, the AUL will take the white box action, they must do this. And then they have the option of executing one move action. We'll talk about actions a little bit later, but that's that. And that resolves the card. So the next thing that happens on your turn is you're going to take command. This is where you're gonna take one or two actions off of your faction event board. Now I do say one or two actions and that is because it depends on what card you just played to the row. So if I'm the RDF and I play an RDF card, what will happen is when I resolve the card, because it's my own card, I will complete the action in the white box, but then I will ignore the action in the black box. And I will take one normal action off of, off of my event board. My, off of my faction board. So mm -hmm. by playing my own card, I ignore the black box and I take one normal action off of my card, off of my, off of my faction sheet. But if I play a different faction's event card and they take the white box and optionally the black box action, then when I take command, because I played another player's faction event card, I get to take two different actions off of my faction event board and I have just unlocked my special actions. So in this way, the game highly encourages you to play other players' faction event cards on your turn so that you get to take more and more important actions off of your faction board when you take your turn. Um, and because there's only four rounds in this game, there's the possibility of being able to get a, a fifth turn by, you know, by some clever card play and negotiation. But for the most part, you only got four turns. So getting two actions every turn becomes really important instead of limiting yourself to one. So when you play your own faction event card, you, 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 you better deem that that event is very much worth it in order to do so that you, you know, you, you then lose your potential special actions. And sometimes if you're really close to winning, no one's going to trade with you yeah. your own card and they're not going to play your own card. So you're going to be, so you're just like, okay, I'm going to have to play my own card because there's no other way. And this event is now really important for me to do in order for me to further my goals, but you have to make that call on your own. But for the most part in this game, we highly encourage you to play other players uh, special event cards, which it gets back to the table talk and the negotiation element. Cause if you're going to play something for somebody else, you know, obviously sometimes you're trying to find, you're trying to play a card that like does nothing for mm -hmm. them at that point in time. So it doesn't really do much, but there's also times where you're like, okay, well, I will play this, but I have conditions, right? Mm -hmm. I'd like you, I would like you to play it in a certain way, even though they don't have to do, even though they don't have to do that. Yeah. How much are you allowed to say about the cards? Like, are, are these cards visible to everybody? Are they cards in hand? Like, can, and can you tell other players what the actions are on the cards? So what we say is when you get the cards, they go into your hand and they are secret. But then after that moment, you can reveal it to anybody. You can, you know, in real, in real space, you can peek, send over and like, Hey, I have this. And you can mm -hmm. peek at people. You can peek in this in tabletop simulator too. And, you know, it's possible to, you know, what is this? Uh, alt and alt shift will allow you to peek at a card 
Um, so you can put cards down and have other people peek at it. And like, it is up to your discretion, what information you want to reveal. I can imagine a day with high level play where people will fib, especially once we get to like the second half of the card deck where the more powerful cards come out, I could see people fibbing about what cards they have. Yeah. Um, but you know, that's for, you know, if, if this is your first time playing. So, well, not your first time playing. You've played this again once a year before, but yeah. You haven't played it in a year, so it's effectively your first time playing. It's a teaching game. It's a learning game. Yeah, you yeah. don't know what all the events are, but again, there's only about 30-some cards in this deck, so uh, people who will who play it more than twice will basically have seen every card in play and will know what, mm -hmm. what, what the contours of that is. Um, so... Right. So, uh, right. So then there's taking command. So then the, the rest of the bulk of this talk is going to be about the actions on your board. Um, when you take command. Now, the thing about the actions, there's a couple of broad concepts that applies to everybody. The first one is that most actions are uh, take what's called protoculture in order to use. Now, in the show, protoculture is fairly ill-defined, but we like to call it, it's like space Oil. It's the stuff that makes things go. And in this game, every faction has a different amount of protoculture. So we have a protoculture board here that keeps track of this thing. We got five protoculture for the AUL, 10 for the REF, 15 for the Zentradi Rebellion, and 30 for the RDF. Every faction starts out with a different event, a different amount. And the, and the key thing is that when you're taking your actions, your big limiters are your protoculture and how many units you have to to like move from out of play on yours because every faction has a limp has a unit cap and and so like the main thing when you're looking at your actions you're you're going to be looking at that protoculture being like okay how much protoculture do i have how much am i going to spend here and there because there's no other limiters except really mm -hmm. that uh the next thing to understand is that for most of these boards you have this little circle um that's next to the action. So there's a circle with a double arrow in it. And what that means is that that action is repeatable. So when I say that you get to take two different actions off of your faction sheet, what that means is that when you select your first action, if it's repeatable, you can keep, you're, you're, you're in that action and you can keep doing it as much as you need to until you stop and then select a different action off of your sheet. Um, so when, and this is true for everybody, when we say you take the move action, that means you are able to move and move and move and move as many times as you want until you're done with your movement. And then you will select a different action off or, of the board. or you're out of protoculture, <laughs> right? Or you spend all yeah. your protoculture because the thing with <laughs> units in this game is that they don't exhaust, they don't have a limit. They can, they can move as far or as wide, far and as wide as you need them to. It just depends on how much you're willing to pay in order to get them to where they need to go. Um, you know, we are in the far future of 2013. After all, there's, <laughs> yes. there's, there's, very, there's very little that we can't do. Right. Yeah. Um, especially when we're talking about giant robot mechs, right. Yeah. Um, and flying machines. So, um, so those are like the two overarching principles. The next thing is that um, when we talk about actions, the, Zentradi factions of the, the more Zentradi factions of the REF and the Zentradi Rebellion, they sort of kind of do things in the same way. And the more humanish factions of the RDF and the AUL, they sort of kind of do things in the same way. So you're going to see similarities between them. Essentially, and, and what those, those differences are is that, well, the Zentradi are really dependent upon protoculture and the humans are less so. And that comes through in their various actions. So I guess the first thing we want to talk about is the move action. So over here for the Zentradi Rebellion, when you do your move action, you are actually moving on a unit by unit basis. So when you select move, every unit of yours, every time you say move, okay, I move one. So you're paying one protoculture to move one unit, one space. Mm -hmm. um, and so when we, you know, when we look over here on the wastelands, what that means is taking this covert soldier and moving him to New Portland to an adjacent territory for one. Mm -hmm. New Portland fabrication, Northwest Quadrant or Granite City, right? They have a rain. They, that's what they move. They move one territory at a time. Mm 
Um, but you have this special thing called your hideout. Your hideout, because again, they never found out where the hideout was, the hideout is connected to every space on this board. So for one protocol tree, you can move one unit from the hideout to any space on the board. And, um, and of course, because the action is repeatable, you do this once, you pay one, you move another one, that's one, and you just, you just go yeah. from there, right? Um, the other thing is that when you move, units can move from the hideout, from the board back to the hideout. Now, granted, you're not going to do this very often, if at all, but units, so if you had these units here in the wastelands and you wanted to get them over to Monument City, usually that would cost you one, two, three protoculture, but because of the hideout, you basically shortcut it to go one, two, and you can warp them around the board using the hideout. Mm -hmm. um, meanwhile, um, and, and the, the REF uses the same principle, but the key thing is that what is on their faction board. So right now, all of these shit, all of these battle pods here, these are all technically on the flagship itself. So they are carrying around their army with them within this flagship. And, um, and so when the bot takes its turn, when it's dropping units, it will be dropping units from the flagship onto the board. And you'll see that when we get there. Um, meanwhile, for the AUL and the RDF, when you move, you are moving on a territory by territory basis. So when you move, you're going to say, OK, I'm going to select a territory like New Detroit City. Now, every unit within that city, within that territory now becomes free to move so you're like okay well i'm going to move new detroit city and you can they can and eat you can decide for each individual unit within that territory if it's going to stay still or move off to an adjacent territory right so for new detroit city you're like okay well i'll move one to the protoculture zone i'll move one up to the forest preserve and that will make the forest preserve rdf and it will make the raul and it will turn new detroit city to the rdf because now they have they now have control in it control of it. And so you'll, you know, as units move around, we have that territorial control change, but that is, uh, that is how that goes. And then of course, if you want to continue moving, you are, you can then, you are then free to say, well, now I'm going to select uh, Granite City and I'm going to have like Min May and someone else come up here and one person go over to the Granite City uh, from over to the Forest Preserve. And you're like, okay, now I'm going to select the Forest Preserve. And now these two units are free to move together, say over to the Reclamation Sector. Right. So you're just moving things on a territory by territory basis. And again, it's repeatable until you're out of protoculture or you're just done moving things around. Austin, does each uh, territory you select cost one protoculture or is it one per person you move in that territory? Uh, it's one it's one protoculture per territory that you okay. select to move. So in that way, um, so in that way, it doesn't, and, and that's where the efficiencies come in because it doesn't matter how many units you have in a territory, it still just costs one for that, for oh, getting okay. any unit in that territory. And like, this is, this is a good time to mention that when you look at this board, this is an abstracted board. You know, down here we have New Detroit, the Wastelands is essentially California. Granite City is around Denver. Northwest Quadrant stretches all the way up into Alaska. Macross and Monument is up in up in Canada. So like we're talking about small arms moving across a vast territory. So it doesn't matter if they're moving into territory controlled by another faction. If they're if they're moving through, they're able to slip through no problem. Right. There, there's always ways around, uh, always ways around regions. Um, and so, so that's, that's movement. Uh, the next thing we need to talk about is recruiting. So uh, you'll notice that there's a number of uh, units that are on this table that are, that are on this table. These units are considered out of play. So uh, on these event cards, you'll see many things that's called out of play or bring into play uh, or take out of play. Um, and when it's talking to bring from out of play onto the board, when it's talking about that, they're talking about bringing these units. Uh, so if you ever run into a situation where you have no units that are out of play and something tells you to bring it into and you have no units, well, then you're not able to do that action. Once you have everybody on the board, then they're just 
on the board or for the Zentradi Rebellions case in the hideout as well. Um, you know, if it gets on your faction event sheet, that's considered in play. Um, so when we recruit, we're taking units from out of play and we're bringing them into play. For the AUL, what that means is you are that, and that what that means is that any territory that is under AUL control, you are able to take a, a partisan and you're able to put that in that territory. And again, this action is repeatable. So the question is how many, how much protoculture do you want to spend? Is how many people you want to, partisans you want to bring onto the board? And you're able to stack in the same territory, send over to other territories, et cetera. It's, it's up to, uh, you know, how you bring these units on is up to you. Meanwhile, for me, the RDF, when I recruit, I need to have a city under my control. And when I have a city under my control, what I'm doing in my recruiting is I'm actually turning AUL partisans, I am turning AUL partisans into military mecca. I am bringing in the partisans into the, the uh, into the RDF military, and the RDF military also has the ability to turn to military mecha into a Veritech fighter, which is um, which for the RDF the Veritech fighters, which of one Rick Hunter effectively is a Veritech fighter. These are the uh, linchpins of their uh, campaign to. Uh, uh, make the Zentradi civilians content. And they need these Veritech fighters in order to do so. <clears throat> so the Veritech fight, so the Veritech fighters are fairly important to the RDF. And at some point I'm going to want to get more than just the two that I start with on the board. Right. So the, the RDF needs these Veritech fighters because they end up being the linchpin in how they um and how they keep the Zentradi civilians content. So I start with two on the board. I got one in New Macross and one in Excalibur, but eventually I'm going to want more because that's because for me, being able to make civilians content in multiple locations is the way that I can actually get my victory condition and then retain it, which is a little bit hard because you two both have the ability to stop that, right? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, so that's that's that for recruiting now for the Zentradi Rebellion, when they recruit, they need to have a territory under their control with a partisan in it uh, with a with a covert soldier. And what mm -hmm. they do is they are converting, they're radicalizing these REF battle pods into covert Zentradi civilian uh, overt Zentradi warriors. Mm -hmm. So now is a good time to point out that that all of these uh, soldiers have a covert side and an overt side. Oh. Uh, the covert side means that they are invulnerable to attack. They are secretly moving throughout the population. And even though they are there helping to give control of territories to the AUL, they are also hidden amongst the civilian population. When they are on their overt side, they are now vulnerable to attack and um and everybody has what's called a flip action on their board almost everybody but like the zentradi rebellion their flip action will flip overt units back to their covert side oh. meanwhile for the rdf and ref their flip action is to seek out and find these covert soldiers and flip them over to their overt side so that they're now vulnerable to attack yeah. the aul we, we some coin games so we know about the, so, the sweep and the activation of the units which mm -hmm. is a similar mechanic similar yeah yeah and I will, and I will say that, like the, uh, the so we'll, we'll get to that in a second. We'll, we'll get to exactly how that works out in a second. But I will also note that for the AUL, you do not have a flip action because you are not able to see the terrorists in your mist. So to you, they're all they're all civilians. They're all on your side. Uh. Um, <laughs> so uh, so yeah. Um, yeah, so when when the Zentradi Rebellion uh, recruits, they recruit, they, they radicalize REF battle pods into overt soldiers. Mm -hmm. um, now, the, the way that the REF recruits is that what they're essentially doing is these are busted battle pods from the last war. 
And it is a, and when they recruit, what they're doing is they're fixing them up and moving them over to this um, constructed side so that they are able to be dropped onto the planet. So um, anything, any, uh, so any unit over here on this side of their board is considered potential to be uh, dropped onto the onto the board. Whereas these ones are are hanging around in the hull of the flagship, but they're also busted, beaten up, and they don't have the ability to, 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 to work and add to the effort. Um, so Austin, are those ones here considered uh, to be on the assembly side? Are, are they considered in play? Yes. So these are considered in play. The, the ones that are out of play for the REF bot are these six sitting uh, on top okay. of their sheet. Gotcha. So that's how I just kind of, uh, you know, separate, make that distinct, separate that. Um, obviously when we have the human faction sheet, there is a space for these units to kind of sit on. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Uh, okay. So you can see it there. Um, uh, yeah. So there's, so there's that. Um, then, uh, so then which brings us to attacks. Uh, so the, so the main thing to understand about attacks is that the Zentradi rebellion is able to attack any faction. They can attack any faction. Mm -hmm. The AUL can attack any faction, but can only attack overt Zentradi warriors. Meanwhile, the RDF and REF are only able to attack overt Zentradi warriors. They do not attack civilians. Mm -hmm. So that creates a, so from, from, a, from a game perspective, it creates a, an interesting tension where the only faction that can attack the AUL is the Zentradi Rebellion. And they're like, they're half allies. So like, why would they ever do that? You know, I don't know. <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm sure you don't have to worry about that at all. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> nah. <laughs> nah. Um, but when, uh, when there's an attack, there's no dice, there's no cards. It's just, you are spending um, every unit has a force uh, of, you know, has a calculation of how many units they're able to destroy. So when you take the attack action, it's just very simple. How much protoculture are you spending? Like, so for the Zentradi Rebellion, every unit that attacks costs one protoculture. And every time you attack with a unit, you pick a faction in that territory about which faction they're, they're attacking. Because when it comes to attacks, the defender always chooses which units get removed, right? So for the Zentradi Rebellion, their covert, so their, their soldiers, either overt or covert, they will destroy one unit of an opposing faction, whereas Chiron will be able to destroy two. And if Chiron, if the Zentradi Rebellion attacks with a covert unit, it will become overt. The main thing with the Zentradi Rebellion, though, is that uh, each of their units is only able to attack once with the attack action, but because the attack action is repeatable, you can say, well, this unit attacks and that and that and that and that, and you can have all of them attack, right? Uh, in using the, the, the action once, it's just again. And it can only attack once until it goes covert again? Um, no, no, even if it's overt, it can attack. Oh, so okay. even if it has been made, it's just that when you select the attack action, Within that attack action, each unit can only attack once. Oh, and if yes. it's on if it's on its covert side, it gets flipped over to its overt side. Um, yeah. But what the but so meanwhile for the AUL, they need at least two units in a territory to destroy one thing of another faction. And so just like oh. movement, so just like movement, Zentradi Rebellion attacks on a unit by unit basis, whereas the AUL and the RDF they attack on a territory by territory basis. So the AUL will select a territory that they want to attack with in, and then that territory will, um, and then the, every unit, they have to pick a faction and every unit in that territory will attack that faction. So- And it's two it, to one basically for AUL. Yeah, yeah, they need two to destroy one. So if we look over here in New Macross, so let's say the AUL attacked here, um, the defender always gets to choose. So I would have to remove one of these three units. Now, I could choose to remove a Rick Hunter in the battle. And you'd say, well, why would you do that? And the answer is because Rick Hunter is a standee character. He has plot armor. He does not die. <laughs> he comes back. He comes back at the edge of the round. So yeah. it, if you attack me, it might be easier for me to just say, okay, well, Rick Hunter is just going to be out for the rest of the round because I know he's going to come back. Whereas with these, with these military mecha, now I have to go and recruit more in, which is expensive and time consuming. 
Um, so, so the defender always has a choice of who gets removed and these hero standees always come back. I also have to uh, make a point about uh, specifically Chiron and the Zentradi Rebellion. So like I said, all these units have an overt and covert side. We also have a, we also have a piece that keeps track of Chiron's covert or overtness as well. But Chiron works a little differently. If Chiron is ever in a territory by himself, he automatically becomes overt. As long as he's in a territory with at least one other covert warrior, he remains covert. And that is even if Chiron attacks. So if in the wastelands here, I said, well, I attack with one covert soldier, flipping him over, and I attack with Chiron, the covert soldier will deal one, will destroy one unit, Chiron will destroy two. But because there's still one covert unit in that territory, Chiron remains covert, even though he attacked. Okay, and if I um, if I move my uh, overt um, uh, units back to the hi uh, hideout, do they change back to covert once they're in the hideout? Or so do they there there is a part of the end of round phase that we'll talk to where your units will automatically become oh, covert okay. again. So okay. there, so y you might want to make them covert if you find yourself in an extremely vulnerable position. But mm -hmm. if you don't have to worry about it, they're going to, they will, they will become covert again. Okay. Um, so you're not always super vulnerable. Yeah. Um, meanwhile, for the RDF, when they attack, each of their military mecha attacks at a force of one, whereas Rick Hunter and the Veritex attack a force of two. And, and that was a good point to, to just note that attack values are different than control values. So again, Rick Hunter attacks at a rate, will destroy two units, but yeah. still only counts one point towards control where the AUL, they need two units to destroy one unit, but each unit counts as one point towards control. Uh, it's just force effectiveness as opposed mm -hmm. to, you know, as opposed to how much they, um, they count for territorial control. All right, so the next thing I want to talk about is the influence action. Now, the influence action is very important for the RDF and the Zentradi Rebellion because that is how you win the game, right? For the Zentradi Rebellion, all you is very simple. All you need is Chiron in a territory you control and you're able to influence. And what influence means is shifting these Zentradi, Zentradi civilians. And the action is repeatable. So if you have Chiron in a territory you control, even though in this case, Chiron would be overt, doesn't matter. Um, for one protoculture piece, you're able to shift as in uh, civilian one step. So if you were, so if you wanted to take these two civilians off, that would be uh, one, two, three, for three protoculture, yeah. you get them off. You score two points. You get two more warriors from out of play into your hideout. And uh, and off you go. Okay. For the RDF, it's a little bit more complicated. Um, in order for them, in order for the RDF to uh, to take control, uh, in order for them to influence, they need to have control of the territory. But they need Rick Hunter or a Veritech fighter, because again, they are your your linchpins. But you also they also need either a. Uh, they also need either a military mecha or a battle pod in that territory with them. So the Veritech fighters can't do it alone. They still need support in order to carry out, uh, in order to do the influence. So yeah, it's like, if you look at this, it, it needs one of these four combinations within a territory under their control in order for it to work. So having military mecha alone that can't do it. Having battle pat, pat, uh, battle pods doesn't do it. Just having yeah. counter doesn't do it. They need, they need the other units in order to make this work. So that's why it's a little bit more complicated for them and also why they need those Veritex in order to spread, in order to spread the peace. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's see here. So, uh, meanwhile, like I said, so when the ver when when they um, when the RDF does their influence action, they are again spending protoculture to move civilians off to the left. Once they get over to the left, they can't go any further to the left, and each uh, civilian hanging out in this leftmost 
spot counts as being a content civilian that is one point of uh, uh, one victory point for the RDF. Mm -hmm. um, okay. <clears throat> meanwhile, um, the AUL has the so the 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 REF also has a as a way to um, influence as well, but because it's a bot, they don't do it because usually the REF does not do it. It's a really big break in, in case of emergency break glass only. <laughs> Smash <for them>. <laughs> yeah, they, re they really don't want to do it if they don't have to. It wastes time, it wastes protoculture, etc. Meanwhile, the AUL has the best influence action in the game. This is where Lyndon May holds a concert. Ah, and concert. Yes. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a one-time action. It's, it's a, it's a, it's action. It's not repeatable, but basically it's free. And what happens when she holds a concert is that for every partisan in the territory, the AUL can choose to either shift one Zentradi civilian up or down one space, you know, whereas the RDF is always going one way, Zentradi is always going the other. The AUL gets to choose, or you can spend, use these, um, you can use these partisans to give you protoculture. So it's possible for the AUL to amass a big, uh, a big grouping around Min May, and the AUL can gain more protoculture than the next action that everybody has, which is the income action. So the income action on your board is just, as it says, you take the action, you do it once, you count up the amount of territories under your control, under your faction side control, and you gain protoculture for it. Um, the final final action is only uh, available to the AUL, and that is the build action. This is how the AUL gets more cities, brings more cities onto the board. Um, what they do is they spend two protoculture, and they have to spend two partisans in a territory that they control, and they get to put out a city token. Now, uh, these, these city tokens are pretty special. On the one hand, once they are built, they cannot be destroyed. They cannot be attacked, but they also count as influence for the AUL in the territory that they're in. Um, I should also mention that the REF flagship can also is also not targetable by attack. Mm -hmm. It's floating. It's too too high up. You can't attack it. Uh, right. <laughs> so meanwhile, so let's get back to these cities. Right. Once they're built, they can't be destroyed. When you build them, you can build them in any territory as long as you have the people in that territory to construct into a city um the city if a city is built in a land territory that that land territory now becomes a city territory for the purposes of the game anytime they have the city icon um, you can double you can stack cities in the same territory ah okay they can be ask, stacked. Ask that. Yep. yeah they can be stacked in city territories or land territories but it's not repeatable so you're only able to do it once per turn um, and the thing is that when you so let's say you control new detroit city so here this is two to one so you control new detroit city so in this case you get one point for controlling new detroit but then you also get one point for each of these city tokens within that territory mm -hmm. so the new detroit is now worth three of your five victory points for you just by this um and if you were to take the forest preserve, the forest preserve counts as two victory points for you. So the thing with the AUL is that you can win the game by only controlling two territories. But if you do that, you're seeding up so much, you're seeding up a lot of ground for the REF to just take over before you have a chance to, uh, mm. before you have a chance to win. And in this case of like New Detroit being like this, if the AUL, if the say the RDF comes in, and takes back New Detroit. The thing is that for the AUL, you've just lost three victory points, but <laughs> the but the REF has only gained one because they the REF does not care about the city tokens; they care about the territories themselves. Ah. So for the for the REF, this is still one point, whereas for you, it's now worth three. Right. Right. Okay. Uh, so that's all the actions that that you can take in the game. And um, you end your again. You that that then you end your turn by drawing another card into your hand, and the next person gets to go. Okay. Um, now, eventually, uh, eventually, let me just move these guys back. Eventually, what's going to happen is all four 
all four spaces are going to be filled and you'll have something looking kind of like this and this you'll get to the end of the round and then this brings us to the end of round phase we have a resolution we have a resolution bar over here that talks about all the events that happen at the end of a round. Now, there's a bunch of little discrete steps here, but the way to think about it is that you get extra actions during the end of round phase. So you're going to be taking more actions. And so some and so one of the key things you have to realize is that when you're taking your turn, you need to ask yourself, do I need to take this action now or because I get it for free at the end of the round, do I just want to wait until the end of the round and do it then? So when we look at this board, the first thing we look at is a we look at is a victory check, and we skip this in the first round. But we have a little board over here that keeps track of how, but how well somebody's victory is, how well someone's doing in their victory, and if there's if we ever get to the end of the round and there's more than one player who has uh, achieved their victory, the way that we deal with ties like this is that we look at the turn order. So if this is the case where the RDF has five and the AUL has six, it doesn't matter that the AUL has more than the, and then the RDF, because we assume that the RDF got their five on their turn, which is at, at the beginning of the round, and nobody else stopped them over the course of the round. So it doesn't matter if the AUL goes wild and builds a bunch of cities and takes over stuff because the RDF has already solidified their victory at the beginning mm -hmm. of the round and nobody stopped them. Okay. Okay. Uh, three and two. So we keep track of stuff there. So uh, first round, we skip the victory check, and then we do the income and return, and we return protoculture. Now, uh, at, at this step, everybody gets to take the income action off their board, and then we check the protoculture tokens. Now, they... Though again, it's the tokens that matter, not so much the zones that they're in, because these tokens, like temp there's a couple of cards that allow these tokens to move. So these tokens might not be in these zones, but mo for the most part, they are. And when we look at uh, when we look at control of these protoculture tokens, we the uh, the alliance structure breaks down. So if it was something like this. It's not oh two. It's not three to one anymore. It's two to one to one, mm -hmm. and the AUL will get this. Will get the protoculture from this token. Okay. The, at this point in time, each of these protoculture tokens are worth three protoculture, which is the equivalent of game, of controlling three territories. But for for you guys, but let's imagine that there was a tie in this in this zone in the space with the protoculture token or the protoculture token is by itself then those three protoculture will go to the rdf they'll go to me because mm -hmm. it is assumed that the rdf has control of these regions unless proven otherwise by the other players oh wow okay yeah so you're rooting for uh, ties everywhere <laughs> <Yeah>. yes <laughs> Abs absolutely <laughs> um that would be a fantastic um, <laughs> situation or you guys just leave it alone it's fine or zero or zero or in there zero. Right? it's yeah, great for me good too. <laughs> um the next action is the zentrality rebellion and the rdf get to take their influence action again this costs protoculture and is repeatable but it's it's an ex, it's an it's a free in you know it's a it's an influence action that you get to take at the end of the round um and again it, these can be done because of the way it works out it could be done simultaneously but if there's the questions and try to first then the rdf then we have the then what happens is chiron and any overt zentradi warrior will retreat back to the hideout uh at this point so any overt warrior will come back off the board We'll get back to the hideout and they will all flip over to their covert side. If Chiron was taken out due to attacks or card play, this is when he comes back to the hideout. The next thing is the RDF needs to refuel and resupply in cities or new Macross. Even if new Macross is under control of somebody else, they the de facto RDF has control of it. So they're always able to refuel and resupply back at new Macross. But what this also means that if this board stays the way it is, the all of the uh, all of the RDF units now that are outside of new Macross will all have to fly back to new Macross because it's mm -hmm. the only city that's under their control. 
Oh, wow. Okay. Yep. Then uh, we have uh, the AUL and the RDF will take their recruit actions. The Because the RDF is a, our, our, our EF is a bot, we're going, they skip their thing here. They do that on their turn, which we'll talk about when we get to their turn. But uh, the AUL, you get to take your a recruit action here. So you're like, well, maybe I want to recruit. And you're like, no, wait, I get to do that at the end of the round. Right. Then finally, then second to last, any unit, any standee that had not been, if a standee had been taken off the board, this is when they return to the board. Rick always comes back to new Macross. Min May goes back to Granite City and the Aria flagship gets to go wherever the heck it wants because it's a ship um and then the then the next thing is there are special event cards that are dealt out so each round there are two special event cards and these are the same cards every game will get help so that's why they're completely public here they're the same cards every game they get dealt out into players hands of still like um because it's a bot we we will ignore that but for they they ignore that but uh, like Chiron, you get an extra card every round. Mm-hmm. Um, the AUL gets a card at the end of round two. I get a card at the end of round three. These are a context specific cards and they will help. They will help you one way or another. But the main thing about these special event cards is that if you play them on yourself, there, as you'll notice, there is no black box action. Um, and when you play your own special event card, you will ignore your take command section of your board. Now for the AUL and I, and for this third one here, it says take two different actions, which is essentially like taking command that's on the card itself. But for the other two, uh, Chiron cards, it's like minimal, uh, you know, it's, it's like, you know, it's less than, but the important thing is that if you can get somebody else to play those cards it's like taking an extra turn in the game you get like mm-hmm. a th- you get a, a fifth turn as long as you can you know get somebody else to play it for you yeah all right so then then the last thing here I'm, is i'm that- not liking that uh min may k- kidnap card at all that doesn't sound uh- <laughs> <laughs> i like that We're using that, one uh, no, <laughs> that ain't gonna uh, do <laughs> so the the last thing that happened th- this last spot here is is just a note to clean up so we advance to the next we advance the timeline and then yep. so this little timeline down down here tells you who's going to go first in each round so that's already preset rdf ref AULs, and try rebellion okay. so that gets moved on and then we just uh clean up the card space and we get ourselves set up for for the next round and and you're off and then you're 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 off to play so that is that's all the rules 